come here to listen to me. You've come here to listen to Ruth Davidson. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, Ruth Davidson. What Ian didn't tell you is that he was then and still is significantly older than me. And well, he was at university, I was just in second year at high school. So, um, you know, that, you, can, you can make your own decision about how, how different we are in terms of, of ages. Um, first of all, can I uh, thank you very much for your welcome and to New Direction for hosting me here today. Uh, I'm here to talk a little uh, about my views and the views of Scottish business on the forthcoming referendum over Britain's membership of the European Union. Uh, as you will know, uh, we in Scotland have become referendum experts in the last few years, um, but I have to say that I'm approaching the prospective EU referendum in a very different frame of mind to the Scottish independence referendum of last year. That referendum was, in many ways, about identity. Uh, and while there were arguments about pounds and pence and of currency and central banks, of balance of trade, and dry economic statistics, it was also about how we felt as Scots, as Brits, uh, about the land that we shared, the country that we'd built, and of who we were as a people. Were we totally distinct from our friends and neighbours in the United Kingdom, or were we a nation that was also part of a larger nation state? It was a very personal question. Uh, it always is when both national and personal identity are challenged in such ways. Families found themselves divided on the question and friends still tiptoe around the subject. And even a year on from that referendum, it remains a difficult matter to discuss in polite company. The first question that now faces you in Scottish politics isn't whether you're left or right, authoritarian or libertarian. It's whether you're yes or no. And some have opined that this is what will happen as a result of the EU referendum, that we across the UK are about to undergo a self-inflicted nervous breakdown where we spend the next year agonising over what it means to be British and that we will be left divided as a result. I actually don't believe that that is the case and I know for certain that I, for one, will not be among those doing the agonising. For me, this isn't a question of personal or national identity. This isn't about who I am or who anyone else is either. I come at this from the point of view of someone who wants Scotland and the United Kingdom to prosper in the modern world and with our allies to create a freer and fairer planet for others to prosper too. And I believe that the United Kingdom's membership of organisations such as NATO, the World Trade Organisation and yes also the EU has helped us to do that down the years. So for me this referendum is a simple cost-benefit analysis does our remaining part of the European Union help us to prosper and increase our positive contribution to a better world? Or could we contribute more outside of the strictures of the EU? If you'll indulge me, I'd like to talk first a little about the process of the referendum. First of all, I believe it is long overdue. The European Union has changed beyond recognition since the UK decided to enter the then European Common Market in 1973. That was half a decade before I was born. It now covers most of the European landmass. Its powers have grown exponentially, so have its rules. And the laws that are passed here in Brussels now affect the daily lives of millions from Krakodi to Copenhagen, from Budapest to Bratislava. No one from my country, under the age of 58 years old, has ever been asked if they want to be in or stay part of this Leviathan that has grown so far beyond its original architect's designs. So I'm therefore quite proud to be a member of a party that had the guts to take on this debate. I think it also makes sense politically. The Prime Minister has spoken rightly in recent months about the need for Britain to be one nation again. Allowing the EU question to fester with no resolution in sight would only allow for more resentment to bubble under the surface. Resentment which would be exploited across Britain by the forces of narrow nationalism. So a referendum where every citizen has their say is the right path. And David Cameron has demonstrated again that he is a leader who does not duck the difficult decisions. 
He accepted the fair and just call for a referendum on Scottish independence after the SNP won a majority in 2011, and he has now accepted the fair and just call for a referendum on Europe, and I applaud him for that. The work is now underway. The bill that is putting the EU referendum into law is going through the House of Commons as we speak, and once complete, we will then move on to the more important substance of the campaign in hand. And there is no doubt in my mind that this is going to be a very close-run contest. As you will have seen, some recent polls have suggested that a small majority of British voters are in favour of leaving the European Union. And all this serves to demonstrate is that the negotiations ongoing between the UK government and the EU are of enormous import. I am not here to prejudge those negotiations in any way, but I will set out how I think reforms to the European Union can be made to improve business life and governance in Scotland, and in so doing, address some of the concerns that people have about our membership of the EU. Now, attempting to do such a thing puts me in a very rare position, uh, and that is of sharing some common ground with Scotland's nationalist First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Prior to the independence referendum in my country, she produced a paper for the Scottish Government on its stance on the EU, a paper which she argued that reforms are required across the continent. They were required, she added, to boost economic competitiveness, to increase the pace of economic recovery, and to close what she called the democratic deficit, which existed between the people of the EU and its institutions. This was a deficit which she added, an increasing number of our citizens believes deprives them of an effective say over the nature and content of EU laws and policies. Well, the following phrase is, is going to be a bit of a, a rarity in my mouth, and uh, that is that I, I agree with Nicola Sturgeon. I too believe that the EU needs to spend more time boosting economic competitiveness. I too believe that people feel they are deprived of an effective say over the nature and content of EU laws and policies, and I too believe that reform is necessary. Indeed, the only difference between me and Nicola is that while I believe that we should work to make this happen and then put the results of that negotiating work to the people of our country for their endorsement and approval, she thinks that no work is required and that wishing should be enough to make it so. The SNP is now in the odd position of opposing the referendum on EU membership while demanding a rerun of the referendum on independence that we held just last year. More recently, Scotland's First Minister has also argued that more autonomy should be given to member states in areas such as public health. She called also for regulatory reform so that we cut the amount of bureaucratic red tape at the centre of the EU and allow more leeway for decisions to be taken locally. Again, I concur. In Scotland, our fishing and oil industries are two areas which would benefit from a more local discrepancy on how it implements the aims of EU policy. And such reforms, I believe, would help to reduce what some feel is the burden of EU membership. The only question, as I say, is why the SMCP obsesses about rerunning a referendum we had only last year, but opposes one which is so obviously overdue. I also believe that the need for reform goes further. We need to safeguard financial centres which lie outside of the Eurozone. That's why a commitment to a single market is essential. Scotland's financial centres in Edinburgh and Glasgow need a level playing field between Eurozone and non-Euro nations in order to thrive. I support my Prime Minister's attempts to reduce benefit entitlements to EU citizens, to boost the sovereignty of national parliaments and to opt out of the core EU aim of ever closer union. As a party obsessed with national sovereignty, I find it baffling that the SNP cannot bring itself to support these things. Equally, I hope this referendum and whole process of reform can bring about a change in the wastefulness of the EU's institutions, as symbolised by the Parliament's absurdly monthly flit to Strasbourg. Symbols matter, and at a time when people are feeling the financial strictures in their home states, the European Commission and the European Parliament need to show some humility and long overdue thrift. So I believe all these things are needed, and I hope very much that we can see them happen. But I also want to use this opportunity to make a more positive argument. Indeed, I hope that we will use this referendum to outline the positive future that a reformed EU can bring. Too often, collectively, 
We have failed to make the positive case about EU membership. We shouldn't simply treat the EU as a dead weight, with the process of reform only being to lessen the negative impact that it has upon us. We should also be outlining the prize that awaits us if we get EU reform right. So it's my view that as we approach the referendum, we must not lose sight of the economic benefits we get from being part of the EU. And if we can consider those facts from the Scottish perspective, about 46% of Scotland's international exports go to the European continent. In 2013, that amounted to some £12.9 billion. Recently, it's been estimated that just under 350,000 jobs in Scotland are in some way dependent on trade with EU countries, or that's more than one in 10 jobs in my nation. Now, none of this happened by accident. It happened because Scotland's great brands and products had access to a single market of more than 500 million potential customers spreading from the North Sea down to the Aegean. And the fact is, that the European Union has helped that single market to flourish. This seems to me to be a self-evident truth, and it was one that is shared by a plurality of Scotland's industry and business organisations. People like Martin Dickey of Brewdog, who took out a bank loan eight years ago so he could brew beer from a small building in Fraserburgh, now sells to 55 countries and employs more than 350 people. We're exporting into the EU, he said recently, what advantages are there to not being in it? Firms like Vegware, a brilliant company in Edinburgh, which makes recyclable containers which can be composted along with your food waste. For them, the ability to move about freely across the EU is what's helped them boost sales across borders. And organisations like the CBI, Paul Dreschler, the president, told its Scottish annual dinner just a few weeks ago that the EU needs to do more of what it's good at and less of what it's bad at. He added... Most firms believe that the disadvantages of the UK membership are significantly outweighed by the benefits we get in return. And it's not just the big firms. Small business firms support that too. A survey by the Federation of Small Businesses in Scotland last week found that 60% of their members back EU membership. And we must ask ourselves, why is this the case? If you take just one sector, our whisky industry, Whisky sales alone make up 10% of Scotland's exports to the European Union area. One in three bottles of internationally exported whisky are drunk in the European continent, with France, Germany and Spain all in the top 10 of our global markets. According to the Scottish Whisky Association, our membership of the EU is crucial, not just in ensuring access to the single market, but also because we benefit from being able to call on the EU's negotiating muscle on trade policy all around the world. And that last point is vital. For example, the biggest potential market for Scotch whisky on the planet is India. There is huge demand there for Scottish brands, but there are also huge barriers too, not least a 150% tariff on every single bottle. The SWA's view is that the only way that this is going to be changed is through the proposed EU-India free trade agreement. That, they say, is the only realistic way forward. I want our whisky trade to be heard when those neg negotiations begin, and that will only happen if Britain is at the table. And India will only give such huge ground if its potential gains are huge too. And access for Indian goods and services to 500 million person market of Europe is more attractive than organising separate terms with a 65 million UK market sitting outside of the EU. So I want what is good for Scottish jobs, not an EU which constantly seeks to interfere in our daily lives and which is seen by people as meddlesome burden on the world, but an EU which expands the single market in services and is hunting the world for trade deals which will help our local Scottish firms to capture more global share. I want an EU which is constantly looking outward in the world, using the power of 500 million consumers to seek out those deals and putting our business on the global map. Now, of course, if we left the EU, those markets wouldn't suddenly disappear. Of course, Scottish firms would still be able to sell into Brussels or Mumbai, Rome and Hong Kong. But the question, 
The real question is whether leaving the EU will help or hinder them in doing so, and whether we can use our influence within the EU to ensure that it does a better job of representing our interests. And unavoidably, the answer comes back. Yes, the EU can change and improve. And yes, we in Britain can help it to change and improve. So I will wait for the negotiations to carry on this autumn and winter. I will support my Prime Minister in winning his case. And in the meantime, my priority is the Scottish employers upon which jobs and prosperity in my country depend. And for so long, and for so long as they are telling me that our jobs are sustained by staying in the EU, then I will be backing them in this referendum. I know that this is not a view that will be held universally within my own party, and I know that there will be much made of the differences that exist within the Conservative Party. But I don't think we should try to hide those differences. We should seek to ensure that in a complex and often conflicting debate, the public are given the whole picture before they are asked to make their choice. Any individual within the Conservative Party should be free to campaign on any side of the debate that they want. My MSPs in Holyrood know that they have already been given just that freedom, but they will be doing so as individual MSPs. They are not part of the UK government, and as for MPs, the Prime Minister has laid out his view. My experience of the Scottish referendum campaign is that cross-party campaigns for all their internal tensions can and do work, showing people that some issues transcend the usual political knockabout. I think, however, that one lesson that I would urge those running the campaigns to consider is the import of voices from outside of elected politics, people with practical experience and a considered view to help inform and explain the impact that a decision either way would make. And above all, what we must avoid is a sense after the referendum that people have not had their fair say. As in the independence referendum, it is vital that a level playing field is created and that the match is fairly played out. So I support the decision taken yesterday that the UK party resource and machinery will not be used for either campaign, just as I ruled out before the summer recess, the Scottish party machinery being used to such ends. Such fair play will be vital when whatever the result, the country has to pull together again after the vote has taken place. I also think it will be important for us on the pro-European argument to speak up loudly and early. The election of Jeremy Corbyn to the Labour leadership has put in doubt his party's position on this matter. While I may not have been alive at the 1975 Euro referendum, he was and he voted against ratification. It appears too that we have some in the Labour leadership who want to close the door on the 21st century and return to imagined past. And while the European question isn't as big a driver as nationalisation or quitting NATO or creating unlimited benefits. To them, the European free market isn't an opportunity for our country, it's a threat. And we need to make it clear from the outset that this left-wing anti-market position is a risible proposition which doesn't deserve to be taken seriously. And I do hope that there are enough sensible people left within the ranks of the Labour Party who now have the courage to speak up against it. So in conclusion, the European Union has faced and is facing some of its most difficult times. The financial crisis exposed the fault lines within the euro. The current migration crisis has challenged our open borders. It is hard to contest the point made by some that the EU is a fair weather union, one which works fine when the times are good, but has no durability when the going gets tough. But I find myself falling on the side of those who believe that the Union can, and indeed must, find a way to work. And while this decision isn't unlike the Scottish independence referendum, it's not one that affects my sense of self, of who I am. I find that the one place it has touched is where I'm from. I grew up in a manufacturing household where every plate of food that was put on the table in front of myself or my sister was because my dad had made something and sold it abroad. First textiles, then leather goods, and then whiskey. And I want to make it easier for Britain's makers and sellers and doers to get their product to market. So what I want is a better European Union, which puts trade and the single market at the top of its agenda, 
with a stronger United Kingdom at its heart, showing it is open for business and open to the world. I want membership of a club which ensures that we are part of a trading bloc with real weight on the global stage, combined with real sovereign flexibility, not least the fact of our own independent currency. And to me, the cost-benefit analysis is clear. The advantages we gain from EU membership clearly and categorically outweigh any disadvantages that come with it. And I'm not blind to the problems that the EU faces. So for my part, I will be backing our national interest and urging Britain to stay within a reformed EU. I believe and I campaigned for Scotland to stay part of a wider union. And I believe Britain should stay part of a wider union too. Thank you very much. Thank you.